Welcome to the south of India. My name is Danny and I'll be exploring Kerala. This coastal state was named by National Geographic as one of the 10 paradises of the world for its beautiful beaches, serene backwaters and lush green landscapes. I'm not here for that though. I've traveled during monsoon season to learn more about the traditions, history, cuisine and anything else that sparks my interest along the way. The first thing I notice as I ride along the tropical coastline is the amount of coconut trees. You just can't escape them. The local language here is Malayalam, and when you translate the word Kerala to English, you get land of coconuts. This morning I have been invited to Davika's house, a lady I had met on the plane. Her auntie is cooking a puttu and egg curry, and she said it's a must try. Puttu is a popular breakfast choice here in Kerala. It's made from rice flour, coconut flakes and water. It's then stuffed into a puttu kudam and steamed for around 5 minutes. It is high in proteins and fibres and contains essential vitamins and minerals, so it's a great way to start the day. This morning, Shobana is making an egg curry. First, she has hard boiled the eggs that her chickens laid this morning and has prepared the ingredients of garlic, ginger, mustard seeds, green chilies, curry leaves, onion and tomato. Once the oil was boiling, she added the mustard seeds, ginger and garlic. They popped and cracked for a couple of minutes before the green chilies and curry leaves joined the mix. Onions are added and once they had become transparent, the tomatoes were all thrown in. It is important to stir it regularly to prevent any sticking. Turmeric Kashmiri chilli powder, pepper powder, faran powder and coriander were mixed in. The eggs were then placed in and left on the heat for 3 minutes before being served alongside the puttu and papadams. Beauty, that's perfect. Mmm. Mmm. Oh. Got a bit of kick to it, eh? For a breakfast meal. You normally have spicy food for breakfast? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Blimey, I have wheat a bit every day. Put the walker. Put the walker. How's it? Beautiful. How do you say good? Adabuli. Adabuli. I like it. Adabuli. <laughs> Nani. Thank you. After leaving Davika's with a full belly and a tingling tongue, I continue north to learn more about the people of Kerala. To begin to understand a culture, first you need to know what the majority believe in. Just over 50% of the population follow Hinduism, like most of India. Scholars believe Hinduism started in the Indus Valley in modern day Pakistan, roughly 4,000 years ago. But other than building extraordinary shrines and detailed temples, what do Hindus believe in? People think of Hinduism not just as a religion, but as a way of life. Hindus believe in reincarnation, which is the natural cycle of birth, death and rebirth. This is called samsara. Karma plays a big role in a Hindu's life. They believe that if we love and give, we will also be loved and given to. So, each soul creates its own destiny through thoughts, feelings and actions. These negative or positive reactions may not come back to affect us in this life, but could also affect us in the future life. And this is why some good people suffer too. I really like the Hindu way of thinking, creating your own destiny through thoughts, feelings and actions. I completely agree with that and I think that's what we all do. Our feelings control our thoughts, 
our thoughts control our actions, and our actions shape our future. I'm a firm believer you get out what you put in, so if you're making positive life changes, it will lead to a happier, healthier life, and in most cases, a brighter future. I don't think you have to be a believer to learn from religion. But what does the rest of Kerala believe in? Well, Islam is the second largest religion. A quarter of the population here are Muslim. The state is also home to the largest population of Christians in India, even though only 18% of the people here follow Christ. This is one of the tallest churches in India, at 259 feet. Our Lady of Dolas Basilica holds a service like this every day, showing how important it is to the people. Christianity has been here for almost two millennia. It is said that St. Thomas, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, set anchor here to spread the word in 52 AD. This church is said to have been founded by St. Thomas himself the year he arrived. But while we're on the subject of famous buildings, there's another in the south of Kerala with a very unique story. Sri Padmanabha Swami is the richest Hindu temple in the world and it is located in Trivandrum, the capital city of Kerala. The temple came into its wealth back in 2011 when they opened five of the six walls they discovered underneath the temple, each full of precious stones, jewels and gold. They have given up trying to unlock the sixth vault as the priests and scholars believe it is guarded by spirits and any attempt to open it will lead to misfortune as some have tried and died not so long after. This temple has been dedicated to Lord Vishnu, who is the preserver and protector of the universe. He is one of the three Hindu gods along with Lord Brahma, who is the creator, and Lord Shiva, the destroyer. These three symbolize nature's rules, which is everything that was once created is eventually destroyed. Kerala's largest festival is now underway. Onam is a Hindu tradition that is celebrated by all religions. The shops close and the people gather in the streets to witness a variety of vibrant performances and unique traditions. The Onam festival is mostly celebrated in Kerala and goes on for 10 days. There are set rituals for each day which the people here still follow. One of the first traditions is to make a pukalam. These are colourful flower arrangements that are displayed in every household. They are said to welcome Mahabali, a beloved mythological king. But what is the story behind Onam and who is King Mahabali? It's a folklore, common folklore around here that Lord Vishnu used to come down to earth once in a while in different avatars and he would come help people, sort problems, whatever it is, he would come down. And this one time he came down as a dwarf, a little dwarf boy and that's called a Vamana in our language. He came down and he came down to meet this king called Mahabali. And what's so special about Mahabali is that he is very generous, abundant. Anything you ask, he will give that to you immediately. And this, the gods up there had a little problem with that, that, you know, this was going to create a new world order where a human is a god. So that will kind of cause an imbalance in power. So Vishnu came down here, Lord Vishnu, and he asked uh, Mahabali as a dwarf man for three steps of land. Mahabali being Mahabali, he, ne he never refuses and he said, yeah, sure. But Vamana grew to his full size and his first step was the entire earth. His second step was the entire sky. And Mahabali gave his own head, like he bent his head down for the third step and he said, take it, you know, I'm not going to take back my promise, you have to take it. And obviously Lord Vishnu was very, very impressed with this. In return for his generosity, he gave something way better than his material assets. He gave him spiritual grace and he ascended to heaven. And the day he ascended to heaven, like his resurrection, his return, as like the renowned King Mahabali, that day is celebrated as Onam here. And it's so festive, there's flowers and there's dance. 
lots of food boat races and so much fun like it's a it's a whole week long activity of celebration here one, 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 one. Before the Kumati dance, the performers are wrapped in leaves and carefully shaped. It is an honour to be a performer and this year is particularly special as it's the first time a female is dancing. The masks were handcrafted from wood around 50 years ago. And once the preparation is over, they then take to the streets where the locals are waiting. Onam is a special time for the whole family to get together. As you walk around, you'll be invited into many homes, where they're singing, dancing and celebrating as one. But now it's time to look into one of Kerala's most popular traditions, Katakali. During the Onam celebration, many classical art forms are performing. The, one of the main performances is Kathakali. Kathakali is the classical art form of Kerala. They're using facial expression, hand gestures, body movements, feet movements. Everything complete one art form is Kathakali. 17th century old this art form. Katha means story, Kali means play, story play. And we have in India so many other kind of art form, basic on story like Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Purana. But new story also they compose like Romeo and Juliet, King Lear, Othello, Bible. Whatever the story you can convert in a Kathakali. Or the paintings using natural stones and herbs. This is yellow color stone. Name of the stone is Manigola. This stone hand grinding mixed in the coconut oil. You can see this is coconut oil. This is called indigo, this kind of plant. You can see with yellow and indigo mixing the green color. Nowadays, we are so busy life. When you're watching the art form of Kathakali, you can automatically switch on other part of the brain and your sharpness of the eyes and mind to going for depth of the art form. That is, we can feel when we go to performing here. This art form is called Pulakali. It was introduced by a king around 200 years ago to entertain his people. It celebrates courage, bravery and spirit in battle. The performers' bodies are painted in immense detail and they jiggle their bells to the beat of the drum. Indians have a special connection with tigers. Their country is home to 70% of the population on the planet. Here in Kerala, the numbers have been steadily rising over the years. In 2006, they only had 46 tigers, and the figures in 2018 showed they had risen to about 190. Now this doesn't sound like much, but when estimates show there's only 4,500 left in total, and poaching is still a thing, any increase is something to be proud of. 
Kerala has a wide variety of wild animals, like Asian elephants, leopards, and even these bonnet monkeys. This type of monkey is called a lion-tailed macaque, and they are one of the most endangered species in the world. One animal, however, has killed 450 people in the last five years. Despite the stats, snakes are still worshipped widely. Shiva, one of the gods, is also known as Lord of the Snakes. The snake around her neck reminds the people to keep their ego under control. They say when the ego is in check, peace prevails in life. There is a boat here that's been named after them. Snake boats were created in the 13th century to transport soldiers to war. Today they're only used to race in and the Nehru Trophy is one of the main events of the year. Nehru was the first Prime Minister of India after they gained independence from the British. These canoe style boats are 100 to 120 feet long and can hold up to 100 rowers. People come from all over India and the world to witness it. Many people rely on these backwaters for their livelihoods. The water has many benefits that the locals take full advantage of. Other than a great place to wash themselves and their clothes, it provides an abundance of seafood so they won't go hungry. They can also use the fresh water from the lakes to irrigate their crops. The main attraction here in Alapi is to hire a houseboat and explore the canals for multiple days. The backwaters of Kerala are a unique ecosystem that run parallel to the Arabian Sea. An intricate system of canals and rivers provide 900 kilometres of waterways and connect five major lakes. This makes importing and exporting goods very easy across the majority of Kerala. Their major export is in tea, rubber, coconut, as well as spices, which they've been trading since 3000 BC. Kerala also has a coastline that stretches 590 kilometres, so it's no surprise they're the leading producer and consumer of fish in India. There is one fish here that people are particularly fond of, the caramine fish. This is a freshwater fish found in the backwaters of Alapi, and it's a must try if you visit, as it's the only place you'll find it in the world. Rasina is making karimeen poli chatu. This is a delicacy that is popular all over Kerala. First you need to grind up your ingredients for the masala paste. Start with the ones that contain more liquid and add the powders later. Add a sprinkle of water if you feel like it's too dry. This traditional grinding is called arakalu and it is said to preserve the spices and herbs original flavor. Slice both the sides of your fish the masala paste fills the gaps where you smother it, making it for a tastier outcome. Once your oil has come to boil, add your fish, along with some curry leaves. Flip the fish before it starts to crisp. This can vary depending on size. Once your fish is fried, the onions can go in to the leftover oil, along with salt. This helps to saute the onions quickly. Add your ginger and garlic to the mix. Remember to mix well to prevent the vegetables from sticking to the pan. When the onions go transparent, add tomatoes, green chilies and curry leaves 
and let it cook for a few minutes. Lay out your banana leaf. Add half of the vegetable mix and place the fried fish on top. Ramla then made coconut flakes and ground them down into milk, which then she added. Evenly spread the rest of the vegetable mix on and add curd or yogurt. Wrap it up in the banana leaf and fry both sides with a lid on the pan. If you're making this outside of Kerala, you can use sea bass to get a similar taste. Once both sides of the leaf have changed colour, unravel it and dig in. And I think it's the Indian way just to get stuck in with your hands. It's a very bony fish. If you're not a fan of picking round bones, you may not be a fan, but it's definitely still worth a try. Mm. No, that is delicious. Big fan of that, big fan. Now that my tank has been topped up, it's time to start the engine and head towards Kerala's ancient past. Today I'm visiting Adakal Caves, a Neolithic site located 1,200 feet above sea level. This cave is one of the earliest human settlements ever discovered here in India, dating back between six to 8,000 years. I'm meeting with Nash, who's gonna tell us more about the carvings and the people who were living here at the time. That time people are not speaking language here, only the picture languages, because Stone Age people live here. So that type of a very big group lived here, maybe 100 more people are just live around this area. This is very good shelter. Animals cannot come inside that area. That time this area is thick cover forest also. And water body is downside also here. So many water sources in downside, the first cave. So that is the main attraction to people lived here. So Edakal is the local language. Edakal means in between stone. Can you see that stone? So that is this name called Edakal. Eda means in between, stone means kal. And this is the one of the oldest carvings in the world. And similar carvings you can see all in France, Lascaux. So this is the main figure here, one tribal chief. Here is also one, one tribal man is here. This is the front side of the tribal man. Other one is the back side. And you can see one lady here, one baby here. And you can see one wild animal here. Other side is sun worship is there. And after again people lived here, you can see two Sanskrit. The Sanskrit is one is Tamil Brahmi and another one is Pragradi. And Tamil Brahmi means a man who killed a lot of tigers. The name called Nandu lived in this spot. And another one is Pragridi. Pragridi means Sri Vishnu Varma, the king, lived in this spot. Kerala has an ancient past the locals are proud of, and the state is actually home to the oldest martial art in the world, dating as far back as 5,000 years. Namaste. Welcome to the Kerala traditional martial art, Kalari Paitu. Kalari means the school. Whatever we are learning in Kerala traditionally, Pite means fighting. So full form of the Kalari Pite, school of fighting. The martial art originally more than 5000 years history. And each martial art movements are very connected to the animals movement like elephant, peacock, tiger, even chicken. The fighting of chicken also very connected to the, the swords fighting and the locks also connected of the, the snake fighting. So this fightings are all coming from the first animal fighting, then the tribal people see this. Whatever they're using for the tribals, that's still same kind of weapons are still using in Kerala Masha. Bamboo stick, javelin, and swords, knife, stones, all kind of weapons, more than 150 weapons they using still in Kerala martial art. Now in two different style of martial art in Kerala is going on, North, Northern style and Southern style. This founder is two great legends. It's called Parishurama and one is Agastya. Agastya using for the medicine, how to make the medicine. So years of the training of the masters, the legends, the, the 
80, 90 years time, they are part of the doctors coming. So they know how to use the medicine, which is another ancient practice of Kerala, Ayurveda. To find out more about Ayurveda, I'm checking myself into Vajra Ayurveda and Yoga Retreat. I arrived to a warm welcome, and I instantly knew this was going to be a good few days. While on my relaxing break, I met with Dr. Ayashwira to shed more light on this ancient practice. Ayurveda is flourishing worldwide. The word meaning Ayurveda means the science of life. Ayurveda mainly deals with three doshas, Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Vata, the all different types of movements in the body. Pitta, the transformations. And Kapha, where the stature and wholesome. Ayurveda also deals mainly with the lifestyle modification, diet, different types of herbal medicines, and also with the therapies. Massages are the main part of Ayurveda. But massage is not the proper word. The commonly used word in Ayurveda is Abhyanga. Abhyanga is being done with different medicated oils where the medicinal value of each oil is being added over to the body also. So different types of massage oils is being taken by different constitution. And this Abhyanga it helps for the improvement of the circulation and also with the flexibility of the joints. We have got different therapy in Ayurveda. One among is called as Potli. And here we are preparing one of the common Potli which has been used in different condition. And this Potli includes different types of leaves, cuts of lemon, different types of medicated powders, salt, even turmeric being added and mixed in the oil or fried in the oil and made into a potli. After my well-needed few days of rest, it was time to try the famous dessert I had heard so much about. Paladapayasam is a famous dessert here in Kerala. It is loved by all as it is very simple and so tasty. First prepare your rice ada by soaking them for around 15 minutes in a closed pot. Start by heating your ghee in a pot and after a minute or so, add your milk and bring it to boil. Place your rice ada in and cook on medium heat while continuously stirring to prevent any burning. Once the milk turns into a cream colour and thickens, add your brown sugar. Sweeten condensed milk and keep stirring. Next, you want to fry off your cashews, raisins and cardamom until they are golden and crispy. Once complete, Add these in along with the leftover oil. Stir this until you're happy with the consistency and enjoy. Really scraping the bottom of the bowl now. It's one of the best desserts I've ever tried. It's a must have. Palada Paya Sam. If you come into Kerala, mmm. Beautiful. So, as you've seen, Kerala is a unique place that has so much to offer. But what have I missed? Well, Kerala has the highest literacy rate in India. Around 95% of the population are educated. Children here have the chance to learn, which opens up more opportunities for their future. They also have the highest sex ratio across the country, meaning the parents and doctors accept a girl just as much as a boy, which isn't the case in some other parts of India. Kerala is also one of the happiest places to live and has the highest life expectancy in the country. This could be down to their knowledge of Ayurveda. Despite these impressive facts, I think Kerala's greatness comes down to one thing. And for me, it isn't the natural wonders, legendary tales, or historic traditions, but the locals. You won't find a happier, more helpful bunch of people than those of Kerala. There is a smile and a selfie around every corner, and nothing is too much to ask for. I've made many good friends along my journey, and I'll definitely be returning to this magical state.